So welcome back to Vantage. Uh, my next guest is someone I really, really wanted to get back onto the program. Uh, he's someone I've known for a number of years. Uh, it's his thematic approach to investing and separating hype from a good investment proposition uh, that I find fascinating. Particularly uh, during the pandemic, he came out with uh, his Rubicon hypothesis uh, built off this idea that when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, there was a point of no turning back. And in the same way, when uh, we effectively accelerated our digital journeys, uh, there's no changing the way we behave. And his uh, fund is investing in some of those ideas. Uh, let's go and take a look. Alex Guns, welcome back to Edison. It's great to have you back here. Um, I, I think to start off with, it'd be useful to uh, for our audience to hear a little bit about your journey uh, that's brought you into fund management. So t tell us a little bit about your own background. Well, thanks, Neil, for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be talking with you. For my sins, I've been in finance now for 24 years. Uh, I started my career straight out of university in 1997, working on the sell side at that time and writing research, equity research on telecoms network operators and internet companies. So it was fascinating at a very early stage of my career to see the whole of the TMT boom and subsequent bust. Yeah. I did 10 years at large banks, was a top ranked analyst at Credit Suisse and JP Morgan. And then similar to many people in our industry, got a little bit fed up, frustrated with conflicts of interest at large organizations, uh, was looking to do something more entrepreneurial did a couple of small roles on the sales side before being approached for the opportunity at Heptagon Capital. And uh, the exciting, uh, the exciting uh, opportunity or the role there was really simply being given a blank sheet of paper effectively to develop a global equity franchise. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the fund. Well, the fund I'm managing at Heptagon Capital is called the Future Trends Equity Fund. Mm -hmm. And the really exciting thing about it is that we think it's both a very simple but very differentiated proposition. So we only do one thing in this strategy, which is invest in long-term future trends. And when people ask us, what does a future trend mean? It's simply a trend that we think will grow in importance broadly, regardless of what happens to GDP and where governments or regulators, if they're present in that industry, they're acting as effective tailwinds rather than headwinds. Mm -hmm. Now, our fund is quite explicitly pan-thematic, so do not think of this as being a technology fund or as an IT fund. And often the line I use in conversations such as this is that we invest in everything effectively from cloud to wind and from fish to chips. So really, truly playing across all themes. And then the second thing that makes, I think, this fund really exciting and a very interesting proposition for many investors is that we are also highly concentrated. We've never had more than 25 holdings in the fund. So you basically get, with the Future Trends Fund, pan-thematic diversification and high-conviction investing. That's excellent. I mean, and I really enjoy reading some of your uh, thematic notes that you put out. Um, I'd describe your investment process as one that sort of marries a top-down thematic approach where they actually has a pretty strong bottom-up stock-picking discipline. Do you, do you want to elaborate a little bit about the process? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one thing that I think is incredibly important when you're doing thematic investing, just almost taking a step back, is being able to separate hype from reality. And we could spend a whole conversation such as this discussing themes, uh, but that's almost the easy bit. The much harder bit is identifying businesses that benefit from the theme. And then the even harder bit is identifying those businesses that meet all of our criteria. So that's why essentially it's crucial to marry that top-down fundamental thematic approach with the more rigorous due diligence and bottom-up work. So really what we do for every uh, theme we look at and business we consider for the fund is really try and understand what the industry drivers are, what the industry might look like or how a theme may play out on a long term five to ten year view. And then generally in the process of doing that research, reading around the topic, talking to people in our network, going to industry events, just digging around, we tend to identify a handful of companies that look potentially well placed to benefit from that theme. Then we apply some very strict criteria. We only want pure play businesses. We only want industry leaders. We only want proven and out innovators. And if companies pass those tests, then we go on, we do the more fundamental, traditional due diligence work, building our own financial models, uh, writing our own investment briefings, interacting with management teams, yeah. and obviously looking at all of this through an ESG lens as well. Okay. So, I mean, it, it, that should lead you into picking high quality companies. I mean, I think um, 
the pandemic was an interesting moment because it created a significant change in the way we do things. And, and one of the things that really stood out for me uh, was how you articulated this. Could you give us the, the an overview of your Rubicon hypothesis and reflect on whether it's played out in the way that you expected? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, this was really an idea that I developed or started developing when we were all essentially locked down at home uh, last March um, last year. And essentially listening to what companies were saying, looking at how myself and many people around me were responding to the changes that the pandemic effectively engendered. And really the idea of the Rubicon thesis very simply is that we have all become digital by default. So effectively, if you think about your classic history, uh, when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, the idea was that there was no turning back. Mm -hmm. If you think about how long it takes for most habits to form, it's typically about 60 days. And therefore, a lot of the behavior that we started doing in the pandemic, we think has now become quite entrenched. And certainly, if you wind the clock on to today, um, and we look at a number of different vectors, I think we see very good supporting evidence. Even last year, there was the very famous line from Satya Nadella of Microsoft saying we'd seen two years worth of digital transformation within two months. And then if you think about your own behavior, you look at the statistics, whether it's online retail, whether it's digital payment, whether it's an addition, additional learning tools with regard to education, I think we can see that many of these themes have really played out along the lines we anticipated. One final important point, though, that I'd make and this is something absolutely crucial, I think, for, for all of our listeners, is that there's still absolutely a long runway to go mm -hmm. in the sense that if you look at, say, percentage of cash transactions by volume done digitally, you look at percentage of retail purchases done online, we're still only scratching the surface. Globally, it's 20, 25 percent. And that's what really makes us excited about the future, that we've got this really strong secular trends continuing to play out. Is there any other themes that you wanted to expand on and um, maybe illustrate those with a couple of uh, stock picks that the sort of company? Sure. I mean, I, I'll just call out two names in very different areas. I mean, one, sticking with the, the digital theme and the idea of uh, platforms, which I think is something which really characterizes much of our daily life. One of the investments we made in the course of 2021 was Airbnb. Now, this is a business that we first started following back in 2016. We wrote a thematic piece at that stage about the sharing economy mm -hmm. and the idea that the creation of platforms where you link disparate buyers and sellers together actually creates a trusted source and you're creating a market from scratch. That's really the definition of, out, of, of innovation. So Airbnb listed in 2019. We started looking at the company at that stage. Clearly, the pandemic came along. Um, it was a reset for everyone. It forced Airbnb to become more flexible as a business, to redesign its, uh, its app, its search engine. And we noticed quarter after quarter, this business was becoming closer and closer to free cash flow generation. That was the final trigger for us. And then if you think about the future trend to which this business is exposed, it's not only the digitalization of the leisure experience, but it's also the fact that people want flexible accommodation. But really, just to return to this uh, absolutely crucial point that what we are doing is pan-thematic, really to talk about one totally different theme where we've seen, again, a huge amount of evidence play out, particularly as a result of the pandemic, is within the space of alternative energy. Mm -hmm. And this is an area we've been following for a very long time. We uh, first wrote about wind in 2018. We made an investment in uh, wind turbines at that stage. We made an investment in solar in very early 2020. And it's become abundantly clear when you look at messaging from governments, when you look at how people in the real world sort of feel about this, that the green agenda is becoming increasingly important. If you look at the falling costs of uh, actually accessing renewable energy, the like-for-like -like cost of a unit of solar or wind versus a unit of fossil fuel, is becoming increasingly competitive. And yet with only about 10% of all energy today accounted for by renewable sources, again, when we think about long runway ahead, significant opportunity, this is something we're very excited about. And it's a really nice segue into the, the next question I want to ask you, which is, um, you know, clearly uh, since the time you've been working at uh, Heptagon, I would guess that ESG has become much broader in terms of uh, importance for uh, 
people putting money into funds, etc. How important is ESG in terms of your sort of stock selection? The, the simple answer, Neil, is that it's absolutely integral. And in many ways, we were doing ESG long before it became sort of more fashionable or more talked about in the investment community. If you go back to the fundamental point of us, us having a very concentrated portfolio, there's all, always been this element that when we're doing our due diligence, if we have elements of doubt about quality of business, about quality of governance, we simply reject that company. So the governance side, we've been very, very focused on. Actually, within uh, the Future Trend Strategy, we've now published seven quarterly sustainability reports, which chart all of our interaction with management. The other thing that I'd like to stress is that when you think about the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, whether that's better use of energy, sorry, better use of energy, let's say, or more, uh, more alternative energy, better food provision, better access to health care, better access to education, uh, digital empowerment, all of those uh, sustainable development goals naturally align with the themes that we're investing in. And on the other side, uh, more controversial topics, if you will, like, say, firearms, tobacco, uh, nuclear, they've never, ever been topics we've looked at. So we've almost been sustainable without fully, uh, fully documenting that. And certainly now, when you look at the external verification, whether it's from MSCI, whether it's from Morningstar, and for the record, we're classified as an Article 8 fund, uh, it's very clear that what we're doing is, uh, is, is highly sustainable. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice when the market sort of converges with you. Now, I, you know, one of the reasons I always enjoy talking to you, Alex, is that I think that uh, you're one of those sort of thinkers that are able to sort of connect the dots and make sense of the world. Um, you've been running the Future Tent Trend Front Trends Fund for five years now. Um, I, I guess it's a question, of, a human nature question. What surprised you the most over those five years? Yeah, I mean, it's been certainly a huge journey. And actually, come January, it will be our sixth anniversary mm -hmm. for the fund. And I'd, I'd probably call out a few things. Number one would be that the general cadence of the debate about thematic investing has definitely improved. The awareness many investors have about the importance of, say, having an allocation to thematic funds and how uh, the broad investment community approaches the topic of thematic investing has definitely increased in that period of time. That would be observation number one. Observation number two, and I could have said this really to you at any stage in, in this period, is really the lesson I alluded to at the beginning of our discussion, that it's so important to maintain rigour to separate hype from reality. Mm. We've been asked a lot of questions recently about Rivian, for example. We regularly get asked questions about cryptocurrency. A few years ago, the debate was about Uber and Lyft. And they may or may not be good business models or good business opportunities. But from our point of view, at the time, none of them was, was an appropriate investment for the fund. And maintaining rigor, separating hype and reality is absolutely crucial. The third and final point I'd make is really just this wonderful capacity for all companies to continue pushing the boundaries for innovation. And you know, when we engage with our businesses, which as I said, is a very regular, crucial part of our strategy, and you just listen to where they're allocating their R&D dollars today, whether it's quantum, whether it's blockchain, uh, whether it's uh, more virtualization, even things we can't possibly even conceive of today or that companies are not yet fully talking about, the fact that companies want to innovate is to my mind, very empowering. And it just makes the idea of the future in, in a very broad sense, and from a more specific sense, in my job of investing in the future, the, the opportunity set only continues to grow. Thank you very much. Alex Guns. thank you very much for coming back on Edison TV. It's been a pleasure hearing an update uh, from you. There you go, people. The uh, Heptagon Future Trends Fund, really worth taking a look at. Um, Alex writes some great material, so uh, go onto the website if, and hopefully you can read some of his uh, thoughts about thematic investing as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show again, Neil.